All right, church, let's sing together, shall we? Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder? Who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder? The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You lay down your life. That I would be set free. chaos back into order who makes the orphan a son and daughter the king of glory the king of glory who rules the nations with truth and justice shines like the sun in all of its brilliance the king of glory the king above all kings this is amazing grace. This is a failing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You lay down your life. That I would be set free. Jesus.
the voices. <laughs> Jesus, we love you. Oh, how we love you. You are the one. Hearts adore. Sing it again, church. Jesus, we love you. Oh, how we love you. You are the one. Our hearts adore. Turn to a neighbor this morning and tell them that Jesus adores them too. so thankful so thankful isn't it great to be in the Lord's house today to be called his children that he is our great king let's give him thanks today if you came prepared to give this morning this will be the time for that the deacons will be around shortly but let's pray this morning and let's uh, let's be truly thankful father we just want to say how thankful we are that we are able to get in out of the rain, to get in out of the cold, to sing what we just sang to you. Father, we are, we are so deeply in love with you. We love you, Jesus. Lord, as we take time to worship you through giving, we do so with joyful hearts, glad souls. It's a good day. It's a good day. Thank you for all that you've done, Jesus. In your name that we pray. And everyone said, Amen.
your mind and your energies on him.
you did on the cross. If you did not receive the elements when you came in today, then now would be a good time to make your way to the tables where they are located, towards the front, to the right, to the left. There's a cup, and that cup contains the juice that represents his blood that was spilled for the remission of our sins. And there's another cup as well that contains the bread that represents the body of Jesus that was broken for us on the cross. Why did Jesus choose to do it this way? He knew knowing that we were referred to as sheep that we would easily forget. And so that's the reason why we here at, at Grace Point choose to remember weekly how soon we forget. It's no small thing what Jesus did on the cross, making a way home having eternal, eternal promises with him in heaven. This is not our home. So, as the Spirit leads and guides you today, remember, bring yourself before him and remember. And as he leads and guides you, go ahead and partake of his body and his blood today, okay? You know, just as we, just as we take communion to remind ourselves of what Jesus did, 
and I'm reminded by the sound of the water in the baptistry during the worship that we have been made new because of what Jesus did. That through the waters of baptism, the old man is laid dead with Christ and we are raised to new life. And man, I'm so thankful that, for that. I don't know about you guys, but I want to recognize this morning how much we need Jesus.
decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning Church, would you stand with me this morning? We want to pray for each other here today. Everybody comes from different seasons of life. I don't know where you find yourself today, but it's good to be reminded that no matter where you find yourself, God is there beside you. He's with you. And so uh, whether you're on the mountaintop or in the valley right now, God is good. Let's acknowledge him for his goodness and thank him for that today. Father, it's good to be here today. Thank you for allowing us the privilege of being together as a family in this place today. May we find ourselves in the comfort of your home, sitting down with you and breaking bread and enjoying conversation, Worshiping you, Father, for who you are, the eternal God who has made himself known through your Son, our Savior, Jesus. Knowing that you love us in ways that are at times unimaginable to us. When we do not feel very lovely, you still love us. There's nothing that we could do make you love us any more than you do right now. So thank you for that. Thank you that we have that knowledge here in this place. And today we also are mindful of the fact that your church is a huge church. Over two billion strong, Lord, of people who love you, serve you throughout the world. And so today we pray for your church as it gathers wherever it is today. May you bless those individual bodies of yours as they gather together just as you do us and may we see ourselves today as a part of that grand church you're building so bless us we yield to you and your spirit today the truth of your word let it settle in our heart and may we leave today just a little bit better than when we came in because we've been in your presence in jesus name amen well you can have a seat it's good to see you this morning. We're certainly glad you're here. Well, I hope you had a great Thanksgiving uh, and ate a lot. If you, uh, yeah, if you, uh, if you're on a diet, uh, sorry about that. Uh, I remember years ago, Chuck Swindoll, my mentor, uh, talking about dieting. You know, you make a decision to diet, you start eating stuff that looks like bird seed, and you exercise and. And then Thanksgiving rolls around and you indulge and then Christmas and by the first of the year he says the blimp's back in the hangar, you know. But it's there to enjoy. Uh, thank you for all of you who uh, contributed to our community Thanksgiving dinner, uh, those of you who cooked and donated turkeys and those of you who came and served. Uh, we had a great, great time and it was a privilege uh, for some of us to take some leftover turkey and mashed potatoes and stuffing and green beans to the gospel mission. I was privileged to drop some food off there on my way home, and I talked to a bunch of guys who were sitting outside. Boy, their mouths started watering by the time I was telling them what they were getting ready to eat. My wife dropped some stuff off at the Salvation Army, so thank you for your sacrifice and, uh, and all that you did to make Thanksgiving just a little bit more enjoyable for so many people. As we uh, close the book on Thanksgiving, we uh, look into the Christmas season. In your bulletin, I want to point your attention to a couple of inserts regarding something that we're calling gifts of grace. If you uh, uh, need help with a Christmas gift this year for your kids because finances are tight, or if you know of someone who might need assistance, there's a form that you can fill out and uh, follow just this information and drop that into the offering box uh, before you leave today or make sure that you bring it by the church office or bring it next week with you. And we're going to be collecting uh, these gifts, and then we're going to be opening up uh, a gift store 
on Monday, December 18th from 4 to 7 p.m., where you can come in as a parent. If you have your kids with you, we'll watch your kids and take care of them while you shop in the gift store and pick up some things for your kids. And so uh, we want to provide that opportunity for you. If you'd like to help on the, uh, on the night of the 18th from 4 to 7 p.m., there's a place for you to fill that out as well. So take note of that as we move into the Christmas season. Also, uh, just be aware that Christmas Eve this year is on Sunday. Christmas is on a Monday. And so we've chosen as a staff to have our regular services Christmas Eve. We would typically do a noon, four, and six service, but we thought it would be best. Let's keep 8, 9, 15, and 11 on Christmas Eve. And so take note of that and uh, be inviting your family and friends. Uh, Christmas is the number one opportunity for outreach for the church. Did you know that? used to be Easter, but now it's Christmas. Uh, people are very receptive to coming on Christmas Eve and to be with their family and their friends and to fellowship and worship. And so be, take advantage of that opportunity to invite your family and your friends. Other stuff going on this week, Tuesday morning men's Bible study as usual, Tuesday morning and Tuesday night women's Bible studies, our life groups on Wednesday nights, all that is in your bulletin, so take note of that as it applies to you. Uh, if you have your Bibles, we find ourselves in 1 Samuel today, in your Old Testaments, 1 Samuel. If you're a guest with us today, welcome. We want you to know that we are following a book called The Story. It is a chronological viewpoint of the Scripture. It's a 30,000 viewpoint, a foot viewpoint of God's upper story of how he has moved and worked throughout time and is continuing to move and work and how our lower story, your life and mine, plays into that. And so we like for everybody to have a copy of this. If you don't have one, you can get one at the information table today. We've got three more cases in this week. We've given out well over 1,000 already. Uh, they're $7 a piece. If you can't afford it, don't worry. Go get one anyway and take it home with you. Uh, if you're listening online, we welcome you. We know that there are hundreds that are following online as well and studying with us, and so welcome. And this uh, week, your assignment is Chapter 10 chapter 10 in the story, and it's going to be covering what I'm teaching about today out of 1 Samuel. Uh, last week, if you were here, we talked about the book of Ruth. Uh, Ruth was a, a very engaging story of the redemption of God and the faithfulness of God to take care of his people, so showing how God oftentimes takes us from a place of happiness through despair to joy that God wants us to be released from the circumstances of life that we think need to be there for us to be happy and oftentimes to let go of those things that we think we have to have to be happy. He'll take us through a time of despair, a time of brokenness so that we can get to a place of joy where we see that he is all we need. We can rest in him and joy is something that can never be taken away from you. The book of Ruth took place during the period of the judges which two weeks ago we studied about. Most people think that the story of Naomi and Ruth and Boaz took place during the, the reign of Gideon, one of the judges of Israel. And if you look at the last chapter of the book of Judges, uh, there's a telling verse in Judges 21, verse 25. And this is what it says. In those days, Israel had no king. All the people did whatever seemed right in their own eyes. So that's the scene. As we move into the book of 1 Samuel, that verse kind of sums up all of the violence and the sin and the idolatry and the inconsistency of the nation of Israel throughout the period of Judges. If you were here for that study, I shared with you that one scholar referred to that period of time in Israel's history as the saw-toothed history of Israel. If you think of a saw with the blade and the sharpness of the blade, the teeth of the blade, up and down, up and down, up and down. That was the nation of Israel. They followed this cycle. They would sin, and as a result of their sin, they would be thrown into servitude to a foreign nation in power. In their servitude, they would have sorrow and cry out to God and repent, and God would bring salvation. But as soon as they were settled once again into their life, they would sin again. And this cycle just continues to repeat itself throughout nation, the Israel's history. Uh, everyone did whatever seemed right in their own eyes. And I'll tell you right now, that is a recipe for disaster. 
It was a recipe for disaster for the nation of Israel, and I think you would agree with me, it's the recipe for disaster for our culture today. Everyone does whatever seems right in their own eyes, and whenever that happens, when there's no standard to live up to, when there's no truth to guide you, then it breeds chaos, and it breeds unrest, and it breeds instability, and that's what we're seeing in our culture today as well. As we move into the book of 1 Samuel, not much has changed for Israel. Uh, they constantly find themselves at war. Uh, there didn't to see, seem to be any end in sight for all the battles that they were having to wage and fight in. And so we find themselves at a period of time where they look around at all the other nations around them and they go, you know, hey, there's something different about them. They've got a king to lead them and to guide them and to lead them into battle and we don't have a king and so this is the time when Israel is desiring a king for themselves they want to be like the other nations and as you read in chapter 10 of the story this week uh, you're going to read about a godly woman by the name of Hannah who uh, who prays for a child she desperately wanted to have a child and the Lord shows favor upon Hannah and Hannah said Lord if you'll allow me to conceive I will dedicate this child back to you. And so she has a boy, and his name is Samuel, and she dedicates Samuel to the Lord. And Samuel goes to live in the home of Eli, the priest of God, and there he's raised with Eli and his two sons. And Samuel is raised up in this godly environment, and he's trained to be a priest, and he grows to become a godly leader over the nation of Israel. And as, uh, as Samuel is getting just a little bit older and the people continue to see their struggles with other nations, all of the elders of Israel are going to gather together and it's a scene, that the best way I can describe it would be like a, a protest scene. I can picture them holding up picket signs in front of Samuel saying, we want a king, give us a king. And so in 1 Samuel chapter 8, if you have your Bibles open there, this is what we read about the demands of the Israelite people. Verse 1 of chapter 8, As Samuel grew old, he appointed his sons to be judges over Israel, Joel, Joel and Abijah, his oldest, son, or his, uh, his oldest sons, held court in Beersheba. But they were not like their father, for they were greedy for money. They accepted bribes and perverted justice. And so there's sin in the camp. Finally, all the elders of Israel met at Ramah to discuss this matter with Samuel. Look, they told him, you are now old, your sons are not like you. Give us a king to judge us like all the other nations have. Samuel was displeased with their request and went to the Lord for guidance. Do everything they say to you, the Lord replied, for it is me they are rejecting, not you. They don't want me to be their king any longer. Ever since I brought them from Egypt, they have continually abandoned me and followed other gods, and now they're giving you the same treatment. Do as they ask, but solemnly warn them about the way a king will reign over them. So the people cry for a king. God says, fine, give them what they want, but let them know that what they want is really not what they need, and they might regret that decision down the road. You know, here's what I discover about God. Maybe you have too. Sometimes... God does for us or to us what an earthly father does or an earthly parent does. He allows uh, immature children to get what they cry for, knowing that it's not good for them, but when he allows them to get what they need, then maybe they determine down the road that that's really not what they needed after all. So the, you know, the child comes to the parent and says, I, I just want to eat candy. That's all I want. I don't want to eat anything. I just want candy. And so the father or the mother or both say, well, then candy it is. For the next 24 hours, all you will eat is candy, and you'll eat it constantly. And when the child gets sick of eating all the can and candy, then maybe they will learn a lesson. That's kind of what God is doing with the nation of Israel. He says, you, you want a king? Fine. Then have a king and see how you like it. And so in this narrative that we're unfolding today and that you're going to read about in chapter 10... God allows the nation of Israel to make three very foolish choices. 
And the thing that's really cool about this is the choices that Israel made are oftentimes the very choices that we make as well. What's so relevant about the Bible, if you're new to Christianity or if you're just kind of kicking tires or checking things out, in Romans chapter 14, a book in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul says, these things have been written, and he's talking about the Old Testament. These things have been written so that we can learn from those who have gone before us. So we get to read these stories, and we have this wonderful opportunity to look back and see the things that people did right and see the things that people did wrong, and we can learn from that. And what we learn from this story that we're studying this week is that there were three foolish choices that Israel made that we can be aware of and try to avoid making ourselves. The first choice was this. They chose power over purpose. Power over purpose. Let me explain what I mean by that. If you remember in our study at the very beginning of this journey a few weeks ago, back in Genesis chapter 12, uh, God called a guy named Abram. You might remember him. He was later renamed Abraham. And he called Abram to start a, a new nation, a nation that would be called Israel. Remember he said, look to the stars in heaven, as many stars as you see, so shall your descendants be. And if you remember what God told Abraham, it was very significant about what this nation was going to be like. It was going to be different. He says to Abram, you will be a blessing to all nations. And he says, everyone will be blessed through you. Do you remember that? Remember reading that and studying that? Well, here's what you've got to understand. God was not creating just another nation like any other nation that existed at the time. He was creating a very special people with a very special purpose. And here's the purpose that people would see as he guided this fledgling nation that the God of this nation was a very powerful God, an all-powerful God. And the purpose of the nation was that glory and honor would not go to the nation, but that glory and honor would go to God. Every battle that Israel fought, every victory that they achieved, was so that the power of God could be on display. Think of the things that we've studied over the past few weeks. The miracle of the plagues, you remember that? The death of the firstborn when he was freeing the children of Israel from their bondage in Egypt. Parting the Red Sea as they began their journey to the Promised Land. Miraculously providing guidance with a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Giving to them food to eat, manna from heaven and quail to feast on. Water to drink that came miraculously from a rock. Defeating an army of 135,000 with only 300 warriors, odds of 450 to 1. Why? so that the people could see that the God of this nation was more powerful than any other gods that were worshipped. That Israel was not the one who was powerful. Their God was the one who was powerful. And so in 1 Samuel 8, what we read is that the people forgot all about that. They forgot about the purpose that they were called to as a nation. They lost sight of the big picture of what God was doing with their nation. And they made a very small choice which would lead them down a very bad road. They forgot that the purpose of the way their nation fights battles is to point people to God as their king. They didn't need another king. But they would have nothing of that. Even after this incredible warning that Samuel gives to the nation. I mean, we're going to read this here, verses 10 through, through 21. And I, I'll tell you, if I'd been sitting in the crowd that day and heard this said, I would have gone, well, yeah, wait a minute, let's time out. Let's back up a step and let's rethink this. Maybe we're going the wrong direction. But look what happens here. Verses 10 and following. So Samuel passed on the Lord's warning to the people who were asking him for a king. This is how a king will reign over you, Samuel said. The king will draft your sons and assign them to his chariots and his charioteers, making them run before his chariots. Some will be generals and captains in his armies. Some will be forced to plow in his fields and harvest his crops. Some will make his weapons and chariot equipment. The king will take your daughters from you and force them to cook and bake and make perfumes for him. He will take away the best of your fields and vineyards and olive groves and give them to his own officials. He will take a tenth of your grain 
and your grape harvest and distribute it among his officers and attendants. He will take your male and female slaves and demand the finest of your cattle and donkeys for his own use. He will demand a tenth of your flocks and you will be his slaves. When that day comes, you will beg for relief from this king you are demanding, but then the Lord will not help you. Now, let's be honest. If you'd been listening to that, wouldn't you have scratched your head and go, ah, you know, maybe this isn't such a good idea. Maybe we should think through this just a little bit more. But they didn't do that. Look in verse 19. But the people refused to listen to Samuel's warning. Even so, think about that. Even so, even if all this happens, none of it good, we still want a king, they said. We want to be like the nations around us. Our king will judge us and lead us into battle. So Samuel repeated to the Lord what the people had said, and the Lord replied, Do as they say, give them a king. Then Samuel agreed and sent the people home. Write this down. Israel chose a power they could not see over a purpose they couldn't. They chose what was in front of them over the big picture of what God was wanting to do through them. And that's always the temptation, you guys. I mean, what about us? Let's apply it where it hits home for us. What is our trust in today? Is it in the all-powerful God of the universe, or is it in the situations and circumstances that surround us? Is your trust in a bank account that you can see, or is it in the God who is over your bank account? Is your trust in the title that you have achieved, or the calling that you've received? to serve God and to be a part of his kingdom and to fit into your place in the upper story of God? Is your trust in the home where you live or the God who's provided you the home where you live? You know, do you, man, look at what we've done and look what we've achieved and look where we live. No, is it going to you or is it going to God? Is your trust in the talent that you've been given or is it in the giver of the talent that everything that you have is a result of his giftings in your life? Israel lost sight of the fact that God was the reason for everything in their life. And the big picture is that he was faithful and would take them to where they needed to be. They wanted to take matters into their own hands. What did the psalmist say? Psalm 20, verse 7. Some nations boast of their chariots and horses, but we boast in the name of the Lord our God. What, what is our boasting in? Israel at this time was boasting more in man than they were God. We wanted some, we want a man to lead us. God, thank you very much, but we're going to trust something that we can see, a power that we can see, rather than the purpose that we can. Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6, It is not by force nor by strength, but by my spirit, says the Lord of heaven's armies. Listen, this is very important. Please write this down in your outlines. The desire for normalization is usually a step away from God. The desire for normalization is usually a step away from God. And here's what I mean by that. When we want to blend in with the rest of culture, when we want to blend in with the rest of the world, typically when we desire to do that, it is a departure from what God's will is for us. And here's the reason why. As Christians, we're never told to blend in. Did you know that? We're told and commanded to stand out, to be different. We're different in the way in which we use our money. We're different in the way in which we use our time. We're different in the way in which we use our talents. We're different in what we believe and how we perceive culture and what we feel is important and is not. We're different. The Bible continually, over and over and over again, says that about you and I, if you're here as a Christian today. The Bible uses terms like we are set apart. We're not of this world. We are strangers and aliens in this world. If you're here today and you see yourself as a part of the church, the very word church, ecclesia, means the called out ones. We're called out of the world. We are in the world, but not of the world. We are here to carry out the purposes of God in the world. That's why we pray the Lord's Prayer. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We want to bring the glory of heaven and the truth of God into a culture that so desperately needs to hear it. 
so we're to be different. And Israel forgot that. Israel forgot that that was their purpose, to be called, a called out people of God whose king was their God. And so God gives them what they cried for. God gives them what they wanted because God is a very gracious God. He will not force his way into our lives. He gives us those choices of our own. In chapter 9 of 1 Samuel, we read this. There was a wealthy, influential man named Kish from the tribe of Benjamin. He was the son of Abel, son of Zeror, son of Becheroth, Becherath, son of Apiah of the tribe of Benjamin. His name was Saul, and his son was Saul, the most handsome man in Israel. So this is going to be the first king, Saul. And, you know, if you're going to pick a king, you're going to pick a good-looking guy, right? I mean, if you've got somebody to lead you into battle, you want somebody who's, who's got the look, who's got the charisma, who's got the talent, who's got the power, all that kind of stuff. He's a handsome man in Israel, head and shoulders taller than anyone else in the land. I assume he had a dandruff problem, heads and shoulders, get it, you know. He's a tall, good-looking guy. And this is the guy that Samuel is going to go to and anoint to be the first king of Israel. Look at chapter 10, verse 1. Samuel took a flask of olive oil, poured it over Saul's head. He kissed Saul and said, I am doing this because the Lord has appointed you to be the ruler over Israel, his special possession. So they cry for a king. God gives them what they wanted. Saul will be the first king of Israel. But there's also a second foolish choice that Israel made that oftentimes we make as well. Write this down. They chose circumstance over salvation. Circumstance over salvation. In 1 Samuel chapter 12, Samuel is going to begin this transition of leadership. The new king has been anointed. Samuel's getting old. He sees the handwriting on the wall. He's going to give a farewell speech to the nation of Israel. Look in chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Samuel addressed all Israel. I have done as you asked and given you a king. Your king is now your leader. I stand here before you, an old gray-haired man, and my sons serve you. I have served as your leader from the time I was a boy to this very day. Samuel says, I've been here. I've done the best I could. I have served you faithfully. I was set apart from my birth, and I've been faithful to what I was set apart to. He's going to continue to talk in this chapter. I don't have the time to read it. You'll read through it in chapter 10 of the story. And he kind of just recaps the history of God's involvement and his moving with power in the nation of Israel. And you know what Samuel's message is to the nation of Israel? Never forget. Never forget what God has done for you and stay faithful to God because he is faithful to you. Always remember that it was God, not man, who has gotten us to where we are. And in that speech, Samuel kind of goes for the, the jugular vein in, in verses 12 through 15 of chapter 12. He says, but when you were afraid of Nahash, the king of Ammon, you came to me and said that you wanted a king to reign over you, even though the Lord your God was already your king. All right, here's the king you have chosen. You asked for him. The Lord has granted your request. Now, if you fear and worship the Lord and listen to his voice, and if you do not rebel against the Lord's commands, then both you and your king will show that you recognize the Lord as your God. But if you rebel against the Lord's commands and refuse to listen to him, then his hand will be as heavy upon you as it was upon your ancestors. You know what Samuel's essentially saying? He's going, you guys have really made a bad choice. But it's really not too late. It's not too late. If you and the king will choose to obey God, then it will go well. But here's the problem. That didn't happen. That didn't happen. Instead of remembering the mighty works of God in the past, you might want to write this down. Israel consistently allowed their circumstances to overwhelm them. 
Instead of remembering the power of God and the provision of God and the purpose of God, they were the called out people of God. He wasn't going to turn their back on them. They would come to a circumstance and instead of acting in faith, they would act in fear. And they would look at their circumstance and allow it to overwhelm them. Now, we can be pretty hard on the nation of Israel. I mean, they were pretty boneheaded. They continued in this cycle, and we go, how could somebody do that? I mean, they were there. But we have to ask ourselves some tough questions, too. How do we respond to the circumstances of our lives? When things don't go as we would want them to go, when things don't always turn out the way we would have scripted them. How many times do our current circumstances take our eyes off of God and the movement of God in our past? How many times do we forget the way that God has been faithful and don't translate that to our current circumstances? We forget that God is the one who saved, who saved what seemed to be a failed marriage. You know, we came to him broken. There was no hope, but we cried out to God, and through the counsel and godly wisdom and truth of his word, he saved our marriage. And then we come to another circumstance where we feel overwhelmed, and we forget all about the power of God there. Or we forget that God is the one who helped us through that financial setback. I mean, we made some bad choices. We invested poorly. We didn't manage well. And we cried out to God, and through the counsel and wisdom of God and financial principles of Scripture, we got our feet back on track. We're out of debt. We're moving forward. But now we face this situation, but we forget all about the power of God there. Or we forget that God is the one who helped navigate through that difficult season in life. All we see is what's in front of us, and we forget. Which leads me to the third foolish choice that Israel made, and I'm going to apply this to our life and we're done. They chose options over obedience. And guys, if I can just be very honest with you, I see this so prevalent in our culture today. So many of our culture are what I call option tenders. And what I mean by that is, I will commit to something or I will do something unless something better comes along. Option tenders. So here's Saul. He's anointed the king of Israel, and he starts off pretty good as the new king. As you read through the next few chapters in the book of 1 Samuel, we find that he obeys God. He listens to the counsel of Samuel. He's fighting the enemies of Israel with God at his side, and he remembers that God is powerful to lead him to victory. But in 1 Samuel chapter 15, all of that changes with one strategic battle that Saul is asked to engage in. 1 Samuel 15 verse 1, One day Samuel said to Saul, It was the Lord who told me to anoint you as king of his people Israel. Now listen to this message from the Lord. This is what the Lord of heaven's armies has declared. I have decided to settle accounts with the nation of Amalek for opposing Israel when they came from Egypt. Now go and completely destroy the entire Amalekite nation. Men, women, children, babies, cattle, sheep, goats, camels, and donkeys. You ask yourself the question, well, why would God do that? And the reason is God knew that the influence of a pagan culture would affect his people. So God says, I can't allow that to happen. I need you to remove that influence so that my people can begin to thrive in their new land. And so Saul is given that pretty difficult task. So Saul mobilized his army. There were 200,000 soldiers from Israel and 10,000 men from Judah. Saul and his army went to a town of the Amalekites, lay in wait in the valley. Saul sent this warning to the Kenites, move away from where the Amalekites live or you will die with them. For you showed kindness to all the people of Israel when they came up from Egypt so the Kenites packed up and left. And then Saul slaughtered the Amalekites from Havilah all the way to Shur, east of Egypt. He captured Agag, the Amalekite king, but completely destroyed everyone else. Saul and his men spared Agag's life, kept the best of the sheep and goats, the cattle, the fat calves, and the lambs, everything, in fact, that appealed to them. They destroyed only what was worthless or of poor quality. Now, let me just ask a simple question. Is that what God said to do? No. God said, I want you to destroy everything. And so Samuel's going to come to Saul. 
and he's going to call him on the carpet. Saul, the Lord said to Samuel, I'm sorry that I ever made Saul king, for he has not been loyal to me and has refused to obey my command. Samuel was so deeply moved when he heard this that he cried out to the Lord all night. Early the next morning, Samuel went to find Saul. Someone told him, well, Saul went to the town of Carmel to set up a monument to himself. Do you smell anything wrong there? You know, all of a sudden now it's all about Saul. It's not about God anymore. It's about Saul now. When Samuel finally found him, Saul greeted him cheerfully. Hey, may the Lord bless you, man. It's cool. How you doing, dude? Right? Did you see what I did to the Amalekites, you know? He says, I've carried out the Lord's commands. Really? Then what is all the bleeding of sheep and goats and the lowing of cattle that I hear Samuel demanded? And here's his rationale. Well, it's true that the army spared the best of the sheep, goats, and cattle, Saul admitted, but they are going to sacrifice them to the Lord your God. We have destroyed everything else. Then Samuel said to Saul, stop. Listen to what the Lord told me last night. Well, what did he tell you? Saul said. And Samuel told him, Although you may think little of yourself, are you not the leader of the tribes of Israel? The Lord has anointed you king of Israel, and the Lord sent you on a mission and told you, Go and completely destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, until they are all dead. Why haven't you obeyed the Lord? Why did you rush for the plunder and do what was evil in the Lord's sight? But I did obey the Lord, Saul says. Really? Really, Saul? But I did obey the Lord. I carried out the mission he gave me. I brought back King Ahag, but I destroyed everyone else. Then my troops brought in the best of the sheep, goats, cattle, and plunder to sacrifice to the Lord your God at Gilgal. We did this so that we could sacrifice to God. What's the big deal? But Samuel replied, What is more pleasing to the Lord? Your burnt offerings and sacrifices or your obedience to his voice. Listen, obedience is better than sacrifice, and submission is better than offering the fat of rams. I'll tell you guys, that's a verse you ought to put on your refrigerator. Obedience is better than sacrifice. Submission is better than the offering of the fat of rams. Saul was trying to figure out the best option. God said this, but you know, I could really do this, and you know, and I could really get a win win situation here on both sides. You get the picture? You know what Saul did? Saul was almost obedient. He was so close. He was almost obedient. And so I asked this, and I'm just about done. What about us? <laughs> what about us? Do we obey what God says to us through his word or just almost, almost? Do we obey him regarding our relationships? I know what God says is right about relationships, but, yeah, I can do it this way. Do we obey God when it comes to our money? Do we obey God when it comes to our time? What about our service? Our dedication? Or are we option tenders? Yeah, I'll obey if it's convenient, but if something else comes up. Yeah, I'll, I'll be there to serve, but, man, somebody gave me tickets to the Blazer game. Seriously. Here's some questions to consider from this incredible story of the saw-toothed history of Israel. To make it personal, ask yourself the question, do you want God as your king? We have to all ask ourselves that. Do we want God as our king, or do we want something, someone else or something else to be the God of our lives? The thing that's interesting about God is he's a very jealous God, and so he's not going to share the throne with anybody else. But he gives us the freedom to put on the throne who we want. Who's on the throne of your life? 
Is it God? Might be your spouse, might be a child, might be money, might be a title, might be possessions. And don't get me wrong. I'm not a killjoy. I don't think it's wrong to have things. I just think it's wrong to hold on to things and not release them when God tells you to. Will you seek power for yourself or will you fulfill God's purpose of blessing others? Is life going to be all about just you or all about just me? Or am I going to see myself in the bigger picture of God's story that he wants to use me to make a difference in the lives of other people? Will you get caught up in the circumstances of life? Or will you wait on God's salvation? Something doesn't go the way you think it should, and so I'll figure, I'll do it this my way. Or will we wait and seek God and His counsel and His wisdom to move through whatever it is in His strength, not our own? Will you obey or will you rationalize? Those are questions that we have to ask ourselves. Someone said it this way, you can't have one foot in the kingdom of God and one foot in the world. There's a line that kind of separates the two. So at some point in our life, you guys, we've got to ask the question, well, where do I want to be? If it's in the world, then you can get over in the world. Live the way the world tells you to live. But if it's for God, then you've got to get over here. And you've got to say, God, I, I trust you. You're my king. You're my king. I don't need another king. God's love language is always obedience, and that's what he asks of us. That's why the baptistry is running this morning, because there's a couple of people right after this service that want to be baptized. You know why? Because they love Jesus, and they've come to the decision in their life that they want to be obedient to what God asks them to do. And one of the things that God says is to be baptized. Repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, the Bible says. Jesus sent his disciples out, go into all the world, make disciples of the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So baptism is not an option. Baptism is a command. So maybe some of you are here today and you want to be baptized. Let's just line up and do it. It's being obedient. Instead of saying, but, 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 but. I'll never forget years ago when I was ministering in San Bernardino, California. You know where that is? That's the armpit of Southern California. (laughs) And there was a 93-year-old lady who came up to me after the service and says, Pastor Tom, would you baptize me? You know why she'd waited so long? She had a deathly fear of water. But at 93, she finally said, I want to obey what God wants me to do. This is a true story. I took her into the baptistry. She was going to come in on a door on this side, and I came from a door on this side, and when I opened the door, there was the biggest old dead blackbird floating in the baptistry. Can you believe that? Of all days. I jumped in the water and I bailed that bird out as fast as I could just as the door opened over here. (laughs) Obedience is better than sacrifice, you guys. May we as a church just make a commitment to obey God in all things. And you know what? When we do that, guess what? We're the ones who are blessed because God knows ultimately what's best for each and every one of us. So, Father, I pray your blessing over your church here. We're just a small part of the family, but, Lord, we care and we want to do our part. And so I pray that we can learn from Israel, from their mistakes. They cried out for someone other than you. It was a bad choice. So help us, Lord, to learn from their mistake. May the only cry of our heart for you to be our king, our God, for you to reign supreme in our lives, for you to be the one 
who sets the pace and calls the shots and determines the values that we live by in this world. Thank you for that wisdom and that knowledge and that understanding and help us just to live faithfully for you in this world in which you've placed us. Bless those who have come to be baptized today. Bless others who might be making decisions in their life right now, opening their heart to you. I pray that as they say to you, Jesus, come into my life, that you will invade their life in a powerful way and change their life forever. Jesus, let's just be honest, it doesn't get any better than to live life with you. Thank you so much for hanging in there with us. In Jesus' name, amen. Be down here to pray with you. I'll be over baptistry in just a little bit to baptize those. If you want to be baptized, come join the fun. The water's warm. If you're the last one in, you can stay in there with the bubbles for a while and just enjoy. All right. God bless you guys. Go out and have a great week as you serve the Lord.